Uh, as Mike said, welcome to the last session of the day. Thank you all for uh, hanging out with us. And we have a little bit more, of this, a, a few more exciting things that you need to know about. Mainly our, uh, some of the things in gastroenterology and surgery and in the foregut that have been sort of in the news this last year. So um, I guess if all three of our speakers could just come on up and join us on the stage. So our first speaker is uh, Prakash Gaiwali, and he is going to talk with us, answer some questions for us um, about, the Pado about the Padova consensus. So Prakash, uh, what is the Padova consensus? Well, you know, Padova is a city in Italy, and uh, in the year 2020, we decided that we were going to have some fun in, in Italy, and we were going to go to Padova and have this consensus meeting. Well, the reason this came about is because uh, when the Chicago classification was devised, it was intended for use in patients with esophageal symptoms of chest pain and dysphagia for the most part. But the classification continued to be used in a, in a context of uh, anti-reflux surgery, both before and after surgery. So a group of gastroenterologists and foregut surgeons uh, got together to decide what the role of high-resolution manometry was or was going to be in the context of free surgical workup as well as in patients who were symptomatic after anti-reflux surgery. So uh, this was a multidisciplinary international consensus assessing the role of high-resolution manometry. Uh, it was led by Renato Salvador and Reina Yadlapati. There are many of the consensus participants here. There were 29 total participants. And uh, we came up with certain statements and a classification scheme that is now published in the Annals of Surgery. So how should HRM be used prior to anti-reflux surgery? So that was the first thing we, we addressed. And uh, we, we determined that uh, through a Delphi process that the evaluation of motility with high resolution manometry is essential, particularly to rule out motor disorders that are not amenable to anti-reflux surgery. And you can see here, here the, the, the uh, image on the left is a normal high resolution manometry Klaus plot. Um, and that is the most common pattern we see in gastroesophageal reflux disease. But in patients with symptoms resembling reflux, once in a while you'll see some of those other patterns. And uh, many of those patterns are or could be conditions that could get worse after anti-reflux surgery. So that was that first statement all about. So a finding of obstruction, motor obstruction, as defined by the updated manometric criteria of EGJ outflow obstruction in the most recent version of the Chicago classification needed to be addressed or must be addressed prior to undertaking anti-reflux surgery with additional <laughs> testing and with clarification of that mechanism for that abnormality or that pattern seen on manometry. We also recognize that some of the other patterns recognized by the Chicago classification may not directly be an obstructive disorder, but uh, could be a response to what's happening at the esophageal gastric <coughs> junction, including a response to a hiatus hernia or to reflux. So in patients with hypercontractile esophagus, with objective evidence of gastroesophageal reflux, those patients could still be worked up uh, for anti-reflux surgery. We, we decided that the finding of distal esophageal spasm in high-resolution manometry uh, may, may indicate an obstructive pattern. And so distal esophageal spasm very often is uh, uh, a type 3 achalasia that's incompletely diagnosed with high-resolution manometry because IRP is not a very specific tool in this setting. So those patients needed further evaluation, need further evaluation if they have obstructive symptoms. Uh, the, in the presence of objective evidence of GERD, however, and in the absence of obstructive symptoms, the still esophageal spasm could still be con uh, consistent with somebody with significant reflux disease. And finally, EGJ barrier can be assessed with high-resolution manometry with several metrics that needed to be con used and continued to be studied in the context of workup for anti-reflux surgery. 
So these were some of the statements that we agreed upon as being appropriate for uh, the pre-surgical workup of uh, high-resolution manometry interpretation in that context. So that's a lot of really valuable information for pre-use uh, of manometry before surgery. Uh, tell us what the classification has to say about after anti-reflux surgery. Well, you've, you've gotten a preview of this on the first day, but we came up with a new term, uh, the post-fund duplication outflow obstruction, uh, which is a pattern that can be seen in some symptomatic patients after anti-reflux surgery. It's important to recognize that some degree of outflow obstruction is expected after anti-reflux surgery, and just seeing this pattern may not be enough. The patient needs to have obstructive <laughs> symptoms. So the post fundoplication outflow obstruction could represent some anatomic aspect of a tight or a, a distorted fundoplication uh, where you have high basal pressure and high integrated relaxation pressure with some compartmentalization of intrabolus pressure between the contraction front and the esophageal gastric junction. So this is a condition that needs further evaluation, just like EGJ outflow obstruction in the non fundoplication setting needs further evaluation. So uh, the assessment of physiology after anti-reflux surgery starts with assessment of what's happening at the EGJ. If there is no separation between the LES and crural diaphragm, if the LES basal pressure is low, you look and see if the fundoplication is distorted in some fashion, is the patient <coughs> refluxing again, so that could require ambulatory reflux monitoring. On the other hand, if the basal pressure is low or if the integrated relaxation pressure is high, that is the context where the uh, post-fundoplication outflow obstruction could be relevant. Again, just the uh, manometric finding is not enough. There has to be additional um, evidence and other alternate testing before this is actionable. On the, if the uh, esophageal body peristalsis fails um, and uh, there is um, some obstructive or transit symptom, it's important to recognize if that is a absent contractility pattern, in other words, a hypomotility pattern, versus a missed achalasia. So uh, manometry plus additional testing could define that. Um, if there is um, normal uh, basal pressure, no elevated IRP, in that context, the findings could be expected following fundoplication. If they have reflux symptoms, those patients may need ambulatory <coughs> reflux monitoring. If there is separation between the LES and the cruel diaphragm, looking at the pattern of uh, separation or absence of uh, separation could uh, define what needed, needs to be done. If the basal pressure is low, the fundoplication could be distorted. I'm, as you can see, I'm not using the term disrupted, which, is, uh, which got a little bit of pushback the other day. But uh, intrathoracic wrap, a slip fundoplication, these are different elements of uh, anatomy at the EGJ that could be defined uh, with uh, high-resolution manometry in conjunction with alternate testing. So this is all fast fascinating. So what are the plans for the future in this area? Well, we've only addressed one piece of the puzzle. One, and I'm using that in honor of Renato Salvador because he likes these jigsaw puzzles. So there are other elements of esophageal evaluation <laughs> Um, in the context of anti-reflux surgery. So eventually the intent is to try and understand what these other adjunctive tests also mean in the pre-surgical workup as well as in the post-fundoplication patient. That's great. Thank you. This is the floor. Yeah, this so is I have the great pleasure to uh, Pose some questions for my friend Stu Specker, everybody knows, the godfather of esophageal physiology. So, Stu, uh, we've heard a lot uh, during this meeting and others on PCABs, potassium channel blockers, uh, and maybe you can just kind of tell us exactly what they are. Is this, is this hype or is this just a more expensive PPI? <laughs> okay, well, thank you. I'm glad you asked that question because I just happen to have slides on it. <laughs> if it's, they amazing. Come up. it's amazing how that happens. <laughs> Ah, there they are. Okay. 
Okay, as you heard eloquently from Dr. Katz the other day, PCAPs have some real advantageous pharmacologic features that do enable them to inhibit gastric acid production faster, longer, and more potently than the PPIs. So unlike PPIs, the PCAPs are acid stable. So the PPIs have to be given an enteric coat, otherwise they'd be degraded in the stomach by gastric acid. But that coat delays their absorption. For PCAPs, there's no need for that enteric coat to delay the absorption. They're active drugs. They're not prodrugs like the PPIs that need acid activation. Like the PPIs, the PCAPs do inhibit the proton pump, the hydrogen potassium ATPase of the parietal cell, but they do it by binding ionically not covalently to that proton pump. Now, PPIs can bind covalently only to active proton pumps, okay? And that means you have to give them around meals. PCABs bind ionically to active and inactive proton pumps. So there's no need to time your PCAB dose around meals when the pumps are most active. They're gonna be inhibited at any time you give these drugs. They also have a much longer half-life than the PPIs, some seven to nine hours for venoprazine, the only one we have available in this country, versus an hour, an hour and a half maybe for omeprazole. And unlike the PPIs, the PCAPs are not metabolized primarily by that cytochrome P450 enzyme, CYP2C19, and there's a lot of polymorphisms that can profoundly affect the metabolism of PPIs, not so for PCAPs. So at least theoretically this all sounds great, um, and I know they've been around actually for a few years now, mm -hmm. so maybe you can go through the data of the clinical effectiveness. Has this uh, really sure. been proved uh, to be as good as it sounds? Okay. Well, fair question. A lot of the studies on PCAPs have been done in Asia, but there have been a few big ones that have been done here, uh, well, in the Western countries anyway. So this one, that. Uh, venoprazin versus lansoprazole for healing and maintenance of healing of erosive esophagitis. In this randomized controlled trial that was conducted here and in Europe, uh, patients with erosive esophagitis, a thousand plus of them, were randomized for eight weeks healing into either venoprazin 20 milligrams or lansoprazole 30 milligrams. The 878 patients who were healed at eight weeks then uh, entered the maintenance phase where they were randomized to get either lansoprazole 15 milligrams or venoprazin in doses of 10 and 20 milligrams. And here are the results of that. At the eight-week trial, you can see that venoprazin had healed 92.9% of all comers versus the 84, uh, what is it? I can't even read it from here, but <laughs> whatever it is, 84.6%. <laughs> so it's not inferior and superior, okay? It was found to be that. Uh, that was especially uh, uh, prominent in the patients who had bad esophagitis. So the LACD patients, you saw a big difference. It was actually superior to the PPI in the secondary analysis. And in the maintenance phase, we saw similar results, non-inferior and superior for all patients and definitely superior for patients with LACD <coughs> esophagitis. So the conclusion was that venoprazin was non inferior and superior to lansoprazole in healing and maintenance of healing of erosive esophagitis. That benefit was predominantly in the bad esophagitis patients and largely on the basis of this study, the FDA approved venoprazin for healing and maintenance of healing of all grades of erosive esophagitis and for relief of heartburn associated with erosive esophagitis and that approval was just in November of last, last year. Uh, this randomized trial of venoprazin for heartburn and NERD, patients with no esophagitis on endoscopy and <coughs> heartburn for at least four days in any consecutive seven-day period during this five-week screening phase got randomized to placebo, venoprazin, or 10 and, uh, 10 and 20 milligrams for four weeks. And then they entered an extension period of 20 weeks when they uh, all got venoprazin, either in doses of 10 or 20 milligrams. And this uh, graph just shows the results of that. The top two lines there are the two venoprazin groups. The bottom line in black is the uh, placebo group, and that's the percent of symptom-free days. You can see that the two venoprazin groups were virtually identical in results. Uh, whether you used 10 or 20 milligrams, it was 45 versus 28%, a difference of 17%. And that 
benefit persisted during the 20-week extension period. The bottom line there is the placebo group that got randomized to venoprazine. You can see very shortly after getting venoprazine, it joined the, uh, the, the uh, venoprazine groups. They concluded that venoprazine reduced heartburn symptoms in NERD patients. The benefit of appeared as early as the first day and persisted during the 20-week extension. And largely on the basis of this study, the FDA just very recently approved venoprazine for relief of heartburn associated with NERD. Oh, great. Um, the, your first slide really showed some pretty unique biopharmacology of this. Do you think that's going to alter how it's used, how, it's, mm -hmm. how patients take it? Uh, especially that rapid onset, is that going to lead to this being the new antacid, the new mylanta, if you will, uh, uh, for patients with a GERD? Well, there is a study, this one that, uh, from Ronnie Foss, uh, that addressed this a randomized trial of on-demand venoprazine. And in this thing, the screening period, again, five weeks, there was a run-in period of four <clears throat> weeks. So the patients who qualified through the screening period got venoprazine 20 milligrams every day, and then patients who were compliant with taking the drug and who had no heartburn for the last seven days <clears throat> got randomized to this on-demand period, six weeks for, uh, during which they would get venoprazine in 10, 20, or 40 milligram doses or placebo, but only on demand, so only when they got heartburn. And here are the results. The, you can see the x-axis there is the time after they took the study drug, and it ranges from 0.5 to 3 hours. The y-axis is the percent heartburn episodes relieved. And you can see the primary endpoint was relief of heartburn within three hours, and it was significantly better than placebo for all three groups. But you can notice that um, venoprazine provided complete relief of heartburn significantly more often than placebo as early as one hour after administration. So PPIs can't do that. I mean, they're good long-term. They get you know, very good acid reduction long-term, but they're not going to give you relief within an hour. Mm -hmm. Now, you can argue, you know, why don't you take an antacid but <laughs> if, if you get that? And I would say that's a good question, but uh, you could use these things on demand if you wanted to. Mm -hmm. So do you think uh, that's going to change how they fit into the GERD treatment paradigm? Is that going to alter? I mean, how do you think they're going to be used? And especially considering that they're more expensive, mm -hmm. a little hard to access, and, and maybe not covered by some insurance companies. Maybe you can just tell us a little bit about that. Sure. OK, so these are two very highly effective classes of drugs for GERD treatment, right? We've had PPIs. That's been our mainstay of therapy for GERD for the past 30 years. Venoprazine, the only one that we have here is the PCAB, less than a year. PPIs are available over the counter, PCABs aren't. PPIs are presently less expensive than a PCAB. And I think for all those reasons, PPIs are likely to remain first line medication for most GERD patients for some time to come. <clears throat> but because everybody asked the same question you just did, the AFS convened a panel to put together a white paper on what do you think? When should we use these drugs? And here are some hot off the presses things. I have to thank Jen Kolb, who handled that Delphi process for us. But uh, these are the conclusions, some of the major conclusions of the group. They said both venoprazen and PPIs are effective for healing and maintenance of healing of all grades of esophagitis. So in that case, how do you decide between the two? He said, for healing and maintenance of healing of erosive esophagitis, the choice between venoprazine or a PPI should be based on considerations of known allergies to or adverse events with individual agents, erosive esophagitis severity for the C's and D's, <coughs> uh, cost, and patient preferences. But for the healing and maintenance of healing of Los Angeles grade C or D esophagitis, venoprazine may be superior to a PPI given in conventional once daily dosage. I personally feel that it's the drug of choice if you find LAC or D esophagitis. For patients with proven GERD whose symptoms or erosive esophagitis persist despite PPI treatment, a trial of venoprazine can be considered. There are studies available to support that. No randomized controlled trials yet, but this is a, a conclusion of the group. And then there are some special situations where we don't have studies, but 
Venoprazin might be considered for situations in which the acid suppression needed is greater than that achieved by PPIs, even when you give them twice daily. I think a major one here, and I'm sorry this didn't come up during the, the talk on uh, Barrett's earlier, but patients undergoing endoscopic eradication therapy for <laughs> Barrett's whose intestinal metaplasia persists to fight PPI treatment, you saw this morning how uh, control of acid reflux is really critical to get rid of the intestinal metaplasia and prevent it from recurring. You know, even with our best PPIs, like if you give esomeprazole 40 milligrams twice daily, you can get the pH in the stomach above four for maybe 80% of the day, but that's it. It's not gonna go above that no matter how much more PPI you give. Uh, that may not be enough when you have such a horrible anti-reflux mechanism as you do in your PPI, in your uh, Barrett's patients with long segment Barrett's, right? Even the 20% of the day that they have ass in the stomach, the ass is gonna end up in their esophagus. You can achieve better results with, uh, with a PCAB, and I think that's one area that is not yet studied, but I think it may have a major role there. Also, patients with severe esophagitis due to scleroderma or achalasia treated by myotomy. Uh, some of those patients can be very difficult to control. Most are not that bad, but some are really tough, and it might be a good indication for venoprazin. And also patients with interstitial lung disease and, and post-transplant patients where if they're gonna aspirate any acid, it could uh, definitely lead to deterioration. I can think of a dozen other questions to ask you, but I think we need to get on to Sebastian's talk. Oh, Maybe oh I'll... no, I gotta give you practical advice. This will take one okay, minute. Okay, okay. Okay, right. one minute, practical advice. Because I hear a lot that you can't get Venopris in my pharmacy doesn't have it. It's available to anybody in the United States. Any pharmacy can get it. They may not want to because uh, pharmacies, when they dispense branded products, uh, they actually lose money. So, but Blink RX is an online pharmacy. It can get you uh, venoprazine. I have no financial interest in them, but they've made the hassle minimal. The vast majority of insured patients will be charged only a copay. The copay varies with the type of insurance, $80 to $90. But if you instruct your patients to go to that Volquesna website and sign up for the copay savings card, with that card, most patients can get it for $25 a month. So, you know, costs in medicine are nebulous. Most insurance plans do require that patient has failed a PPI. Medicare patients, it's tough. They generally don't cover for venoprazin. You can fill out that uh, request form. I haven't been successful with it, but if they do say it's okay, the patient will get a copay and there's no copay assistance. And finally, Medicaid patients generally do require prior authorization. <coughs> and failure of two PIs, but if, they've, if you've done that, the Medicaid patients get little or no copay. All right, thanks. Practical. Thank you, Jordan. Okay. Thank you. There you go, the email up here. That's it. So our next newsworthy uh, presentation is from uh, Sebastian Schaubin, who's gonna talk to us about his Markov model uh, research study looking at determining optimal management of paraesophageal hernias. Okay. So Reg told me no more than three slides. I followed this, and therefore, I don't know, could I have my first one? First out of three. <laughs> no good so deal. What is oh, the there it is. So <laughs> for that, <laughs> we will go through this in detail. No. So but, what is the key message of your publication? Yeah. Well, well I think it's, it. it's, it's, it's a very, it's a very, it's much easier because it's a surgical topic. And the thing is, um, the topic is a very interesting one, and I've, I think this paper has the potential to really change our mindset and change the way uh, what we recommend for patients that have asymptomatic paraesophageal hernia. Because as you might know, the strategy until now, if you follow evidence, is that in patients older than 60, it's watch and wait strategy yes. compared to going for elective uh, paraesophageal hernia repair. And this changes everything. This is the two, I don't know if you're familiar with the Markov model, this means that you <coughs> play, you go into, you go into literature and you take all those um, parameters that are currently in literature and you play them into this model and you do calculations for calculations, do like 10,000 calculations for each patient. And at the end you get the probabilities how this way, how big the chances that this patient takes this way. And this is just comparing the Markov models 2002 and 2024 and you see they are identical. This was very important. The outcome of this study now is, and this changes quite a lot, is that 
elective parasophageal hernia repair is almost always better than watch and wait. So meaning that um, coming from 40-year-old patient up to a 90-year-old patient, you <coughs> always uh, improve life expectancy for, when going for elective hiatal hernia repair. So, so you're between 2002 and 2024, so what made you want to redo this? Why was it time to redo this calcul all the calculations? Yeah, I would say, I would say this is in the first line. You see, this is again comparison of 2002 and 2024. Um, and the, the major thing is that everything changed to laparoscopic surgery. So in 2004, there was just was less than 5% of procedures were done laparoscopically. And today, I mean, almost all the elective laparoscopic parasophageal hernia surgery is done uh, laparoscopically. And this led to three things. The first one was that the mortality rates went down to 0.5%. This is absolutely essential if you go through the model. And the second thing is mortality rates for emergency surgery for parasophageal surgery, uh, parasophageal hernia stayed the same. So this is the major parameters that changed during the last 20 years. And putting those parameters into the model shows and really changes everything towards elective um, uh, heitler hernia repair. We just had the very nice talk from John um, concerning the recurrences. So this is the values that were brought into this model concerning recurrences in so This is only the need of reoperation per year. And you see, as you said, we didn't really improve. Um, it's almost the same again. And the fourth parameter that's very important that played into the model was the acute symptoms. And this is the chance or the risk of a patient having parasophageal hernia, asymptomatic one, having developing acute symptoms per year, and this has not changed at all. So putting those parameters into the new model <coughs> changed everything, and therefore the need. So do these recommendations apply to all patients with parasophageal hernia, or just some? Well, that, that's a good question. Actually, yes. I mean, uh, there was all patients from 40 to 90 mm -hmm. had uh, improved life expectancy when, we go, when, when they went to elective um, hiatal hernia repair. And this, this analysis applies to patients with asymptomatic parasophageal yeah. hernias. What about the, the, the rest of them that have symptoms or anemia or bleeding? Yeah, there's a second paper that followed and it included patients with symptoms, it included patients with uh, comorbidities, because as we know, most of patients having uh, parasophageal hernias have some kind of comorbidities, and included patients with complications like Cameron lesions and that. And it, at the end, it really it confirmed the results uh, that we saw in asymptomatic patients. And, even in patients, or especially in patients having uh, Cameron lesions, it even increased the, the advantage you have when you go for elective hyaluronic repair. So how do we take this work and translate it into real life? Yeah, so this would be my third slide, and this is what it was done for, because this will help us surgeons, and also the GIs who talk about um, what we do in patients like this, to argue with them. And you'll see, this is just one example, you have a seven, 70-year-old um, uh, patient um, with asymptomatic uh, parasophageal hernia with Cameron lesions. And if you go for elective hiatal hernia repair compared to watching away, you improve or you will have an increase in life expectancy up to 23 months, which is quite a lot. Hmm. What is, in my opinion, very important to mention in this uh, context is that all the data that were put into this model were taken out of, of um, high output centers and highly specialized centers. So whenever you want to apply this, you have to be sure that your outcome parameters are comparable to the ones we put into this model. That's great. Um, any questions for any of our three uh, presenters? <laughs> or maybe not. <laughs> uh, thank you for a wonderful panel. Question for Stu about PCAPs. You know, as effective as they are in gastric acid suppression, would we expect them, or what is known about long term side effects that we see with PPIs, mm -hmm. with calcium malabsorption, risk of osteoporosis, chronic kidney injury, and so forth? Right. Do we expect to see the same or even worse side effects with the PCAPs with that care? Yeah, great question, Mike. So, uh, for the data we have so far, the, the uh, side effects, the short-term side effects anyway, seem to be very similar to PPIs. I think any PPI side effect that is 
the direct result of acid suppression and gastrin levels going up, that's going to be the same or maybe worse for the PCAB. I mean, they, the data so far says it's not yet worse. The uh, gastrin levels do go a little bit higher than with BPIs. What's going to be the long-term effect of that? We still don't know. It's been used in Japan for 10 years. There have been none, no untoward safety signals that have come out of that experience yet, but we only have 10 years of experience versus 30. Now, all those other idiosyncratic type reactions with the PPIs, uh, it, it's, you know, it's too early to say whether we're going to see similar things with the PCAPs. Most of those bad ones really are not related directly to acid suppression, and there's controversy as to whether they're real or not. You know, a lot of the so-called PPI side effects are uh, probably not real. But uh, again, time will tell. For right now, I think the bottom line is they seem to have a safety profile very similar to the PPIs. Any PPI side effect that's due to acid suppression or gastrin elevation should be the same with the PCAPs. Great. Uh, next question. Yes, um, I had a couple. I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I had a couple questions about one, maybe kind of a dumb question about this Markov analysis. What is considered the number that, like, what's a good number versus a bad number? Because I see a ton of these patients that are 85, 90, 95 years old with a huge parasophageal hot hernia and no symptoms. And sometimes they have a camera ulcer, but generally not. Well, I mean, generally, the, the model calculated a benefit for all patients, 40 or 90 years old. But for sure, this, this benefit decreases with age. So, I mean, the, the rather it goes into the age of 90, the less the benefit is for sure, and the, the more you might even think of wet, watch and wait strategies. Was this okay. your question? Okay, yeah, no, so basically all of them in her improved, but some of them, like the 90-year-olds well, without camera lesions. Yeah, yeah, you go for symptomatic, uh, without camera lesions, it's only like, it's, it's like a couple of weeks. Okay. For sure, this is, yeah. Thank you. And then I mean, the other question was about the manometry evaluation. I was wondering, did the manometry evaluation evaluate EGJ outflow obstruction with like a large hot hernia, like how that is evaluated on manometry? Well, that's one of the issues of just relying <clears throat> on manometric parameters at the esophagogastric junction. So when somebody has a paraesophageal hernia, the hernia may exert a pressure effect at the esophagogastric junction that makes it look like there is an outflow obstruction. So that is part of the reason why it's important to uh, use alternate tests to adjudicate that abnormality, both in the symptomatic patient, meaning the non-surgical patient, and also in the surgical patient. So the adjudicating techniques that we use um, obviously, uh, careful history and endoscopy, but also barium esophagography and functional lumen imaging probe. The sum of all three tests plus symptoms suggesting obstruction is probably the truth. One test alone is probably not reliable, and the least reliable among all of these is a single IRP measurement in the supine position. Thank you. All right. Next question. I also have a manometry related question regarding uh, Padova. Um, so, uh, as far as the distal pressurization requirement, is it, are, are we to use the 20% of, you know, 20% of swallows kind of cut off like we do for DJ outlet obstruction? And, uh, well, I'll let you. So, uh, when you use manometry, what you're measuring is pressure. These thresholds are artificial. You got to look at the context. Uh, meaning, does the patient have a symptom that can be explained by manometry? And you have to look at the physiology. Does what you are seeing explain the patient's symptom? So you see pressurization between the contraction front and the esophagogastric junction where, when that pressure has nowhere to go. Normally, if the LES relaxes, that pressure normalizes into the stomach. It is just absorbed into the stomach. So if you see pressurization at the esophagogastric junction, there's something going on. It could be something as silly as the catheter angulating when there is a big hernia present. So it's important not to react, 
but to get additional testing if that's the only finding that you see. Now, these thresholds of 20 and 30%, to me, they're artificial. I think you have to look at the big picture. If you just have one or two swallows of pressurization, the patient has heartburn, I wouldn't take that seriously at all. And it seems like we're putting a lot of um, emphasis on basal LES pressure. Do you have any misgivings about that versus using EDJCI in defining these you know, post quantification states? <clears throat> yes, the basal pressure probably has uh, some confounders if you just use the basal pressure. Uh, the EGJCI, the contractile <laughs> integral, takes into consideration not just the basal pressure, uh, but also the peak pressure, which may be important, especially if the diaphragm is embedded in that uh, high pressure zone. So um, I, I'm a little biased because I did some of the earlier studies using EGJCI, the contractile integral, um, and I find that a little bit more useful than just looking at basal pressure. But I would say that uh, in the naive patient, the patient who hasn't been operated, it's better to look for the consequence of that abnormal basal pressure, uh, which is look for reflux burden before doing something, rather than act on the basal pressure alone. So I think our session's open, huh? Here. Oh, is there one more question? Huh? Thank you, you know, for an excellent discussion. And thank you all for 